good evening everyone and uh, namaskar to all so first of all i uh, welcome everyone to this meeting uh, especially you know, professor avan subramanyam uh, who is uh, currently the senior fellow at uh, uh, watson institute for international and public affairs uh, brown university usa and uh, professor subramanyam will be talking about uh, the trade and development policy in the planning era and uh, today uh, so in this meeting i uh, request uh, the president of odisha economic association uh, dr jugal kishor mahapatra the former chief secretary of odisha to preside over this meeting but before we enter into the talk uh, let me just uh, speak a few words about uh, the odisha economic association because i understand there would be a lot of members uh, who are new to this meeting uh, so odisha economic association was formed in the 1968 so we are now uh, 56 uh, now 55 years uh, plus old association and uh, we have now uh, 791 members as of today and uh, most of them are basically the students and faculty members working in odisha as well as abroad uh, in other states and also there are also some members uh, who are not necessarily odias they are from other states also so uh, that's our odisha economic association is and uh, we do organize an annual uh, conference every year during the second weekend of uh, february and uh, then odisha economic association has been publishing a journal that is called odisha economic journal uh, and that is also 56 years old uh, and that is listed in ugc care and we are trying to enlist it in scopus because we are trying to improve the quality of the journal so that it gets enlisted in the scopus and uh, then we do organize three memorial lectures uh, in the memory of three uh, past presidents one professor bhaidanath mishra professor khetramohan patnaik and professor adaita mahanti uh, and uh, and then we also organize different uh, you know monthly events like this online you know special lectures and offline also and uh, then we do capacity building programs for the teachers and the students of uh, uh, basically economics and uh, Uh, so uh, that is a you know, brief about the odisha economic association and for the information of the audience uh, uh, professor arvind subramanyam also participated in one event of odisha economic association in the year 19 2018 that was basically the golden jubilee conference of odisha economic association and that year the president of uh, odisha economic association was professor prashant patnaik and uh, that's how Uh, professor arvind subramanyam and professor s subramanyam from madras institute of development studies and uh, he was there s subramanyam was there on the first day and professor subramanyam was the uh, economic advisor chief economic advisor uh, uh, and he came on the second day so uh, uh, that event was you know organized at uh, navakrishna choudhury center for development studies and the director of then uh, in cds was professor srijit mishra currently who is you know uh, working at uh, IG Idea Mumbai. Uh, so, uh, with this uh, brief note about OEA and uh, about the speaker, now let me invite the president of Odisha Economic Association, uh, Dr. Jugal Kishor Mahapatra, to have his remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Amarinder. I think uh, it's a real uh, great pleasure to invite uh, Arvind Subramanyam to this forum. I think uh, first of all. Uh, good morning to you this i know for you to uh, you know get ready by 9 at 9 am to address us is, is absolutely i must thank you uh, for that uh, he is too well known to say anything about him so i will i mean he his academic work is well known but when he was a ca in, uh, in government of india he did i mean he is one uh, academic researcher who has a ringside view of how policies get made or do and are at least the highest level so he he knows all about uh, both theory and practice uh, when he was ca there are two things i would really i mean i anybody who has read read the blog by arun jetli when he left is something that speaks volumes for what he contributed uh, two things i would mention specially one he transformed the quality of the economic survey the kind of economic survey uh, that we used to see earlier and what he the changes that brought about the quality of research uh, that he did and mostly in house and that's commendable the uh, that is remarkable 
Then secondly, he improved the, upgraded the quality of Indian economic service. That is something not many people have done in the past. And the third thing, uh, some of you know, perhaps you don't know, he held a series of lectures for uh, young uh, teachers, researchers in Delhi IIT, and all those uh, you know video lectures are available in Soyam. It's a pleasure to go through all of them, and I think all of you, I strongly commend all of you to you know uh, go through those lectures, the storehouse of knowledge about the Indian economy, how it has evolved. So, with this, I would request uh, Pankras to formally introduce to him, and we we'll look forward to your. Uh, lecture, which would be as energetic as ever. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, once again, uh, good evening to one and all. It is with great pleasure that we introduce Dr. Arvind Subramanian, a distinguished economist and former chief economic advisor to the government of India. Though Dr. Subramanian, as Jugal sir rightly said, requires no introduction, but I'm taking this opportunity to to introduce Dr. Subramaniam to all the audience here. Dr. Subramaniam is a distinguished economist known for his significant contribution to the fields of international economics, trade policy, and economic development. His academic journey and research work have earned him recognition as one of the world's influential scholars. In 2011, foreign policy magazine named Dr. Subramaniam one of the world's top 100 global thinkers. Dr. Arvind Subramanian served as the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India from 2014 to 2018 during a crucial period of economic transformation and policy formulation in the country. His expertise and deep insights were instrumental in shaping India's economic agenda during this time, and his contributions continue to influence nation's economic discourse. Beyond his role as Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. Subramanian has a rich academic background he holds PhD in economics from the University of Oxford. He has taught at prestigious institutions like Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, the Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. He was also the professor of economics at Ashoka University and a senior fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics and Center for Global Development. At present, Dr. Subramanian holds the position of senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. His scholarly work covers a wide range of topics, including international trade, development economics, and macroeconomic policies. The books he has authored include India's Turn, Understanding Economic Transformation, and the most acclaimed book, Eclipse, Living in the Shadows of China's Economic Dominance. In his recent book of counsel, The Challenges of the Modi Jetli Economy, Dr. Subramanian provides an inside account of his roller coaster journey as the chief economic advisor to the government of India from 2014 to 18. In addition to his academic and policy work, Dr. Subramanian has held various positions at international organizations such as IMF and World Bank, further amplifying his global perspective on economic issues. Today, Arvind Subramaniam continues to be a prominent figure in the world of economics, offering valuable insights and analysis on key economic challenges facing India and the world. We are honored to have him join us and share his wealth of knowledge and experience. On behalf of the Odisha Economic Association, we extend a distinguished invitation to him to deliver an enlightening lecture on the subject of trade and development policy in the planning era and uh, thank you so much sir who have accepted our invitation now floor is yours thank you so much well uh, thank you uh, uh, pankaj jugal and amarendra for these for this uh, very very kind uh, overly uh, it's too kind an introduction uh, <clears throat> let me begin by saying that you know, it's for me. It's a it's an honor to um, uh, come here to address the Odisha Economic Association. As you said, I've already uh, uh, came there five years ago, but also uh, I, I think we forget what a rich tradition of economics that the state of Odisha has been associated with. You know, so many great uh, economists have been produced by Odisha. Uh, it's a very, very rich, uh, you know, tradition in uh, economic thinking, economic ideas. So it's a real honor to be there. 
uh, and if I may uh, 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 be a little bit irreverent and say, Odisha is so influential that uh, you know in India's top policy making institution, the RBI, it's an Odisha mafia that runs the RBI. If I may say so. Uh, so uh, you know between very able uh, you know Shakti and uh, Michael Patra, very able uh, economists and. Uh, uh, so, so the influence of Odisha is, I think, not to be underestimated at all. <clears throat> the, the second reason uh, why, uh, for me, it's a real honor to be here is because of uh, Jugal. Uh, I, I have to say that when Jugal asked me to come, you know, for me, it was a no brainer. Because one of the real pleasures of working in government was actually, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to flatter him, was in fact to work with uh, uh, bureaucrats like uh, Jugal Mahapatra. It was just an absolute delight uh, and a joy uh, to work with him. And I, I also mention him in my book. And I would say that, you know, one of my regrets is that Jugal didn't stay on for another one year at least, because I'm confident that had he stayed on, we'd have been able to reform what is one of India's worst policies that continues to today, which is the fertilizer subsidy. Uh, it's such a damaging policy, and he and I made some headway. Uh, you know, initially we even have wrote a note together. We presented it at the PMO. Uh, we got some uh, reasonable uh, feedback, and had he stayed on, uh, you know, I think we'd have made more progress. And uh, it's one of my regrets, Jugal, that you you couldn't stay on and that you left prematurely, as far as I was concerned. Um, <clears throat> of course, the third uh, reason I would say why it's nice to be here is that. I can claim to be a son of Odisha soil as well. I spent yes, five yes. years of my life uh, in uh, Koraput. Uh, you know, my father used to work for the Dandakaranya Development Authority in the 60s. Uh, so, you know, I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, if uh, between my, uh, if, if I'm a little bit, uh, you know, cheeky, I say I'm half Odia myself because of having spent uh, so much time here. But anyway, um, all that being said, you know, let's uh, uh, talk, uh, turn to the, subject of this. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, when I was thinking of what to speak on, uh, I realized that today, uh, and as I'm going to uh, talk to you, trade and development strategy have kind of changed in a very remarkable way, uh, in especially in the last four to five years. Uh, I might add, after I left, <laughs> you know, uh, things have changed a, a little bit, uh, quite dramatically. So I thought it'd be nice to you know, uh, reflect on what is happening and contrast it with the past. Uh, <clears throat> because in some ways, uh, I think we may be returning to some elements of the past in our trade and development strategy. Uh, so I thought we could make this the uh, subject of today's lecture. So uh, my talk is going to be in three parts. The first part is going to be you know, just spelling out what we did in the past and what we're doing today. The second part I want to focus on is to try and understand what are the ideas that drove our strategy in the past and what are the ideas that are driving the new strategy uh, under the Modi government, especially after 2017-18. Um, I mean, one can broadly say India is once again turning inward. So the question is, what are the ideas that are driving that? So that will be the second part. And then in the third part, I want to talk about, you know, what's happening at the moment in terms of, you know, the opportunities that are opening up, uh, how India is faring today. And, and I just and then after that, I'd love to uh, get questions uh, from all of you. So I, I think maybe I'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes. And then if that's OK, we can open the floor to questions. So is, is that is that good, uh, Jugal? Is that OK? OK. OK. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, if you look back uh, at the first, you know, thirty years after Indian independence, especially you know the the nineteen fifties to nineteen eighties, India had a very very distinct trade and development strategy. Uh, I would say that there were four elements uh, uh, to that strategy. First, of course, that you know planning was the framework for allocation of resources. So. Uh, you know, India set up a planning commission uh, and, and, you know, uh, modeled a little bit on, on Russia. And the whole notion was that the government would decide, 
you know, how to allocate resources, uh, you know, uh, between sectors, within sectors. Uh, so it was very much a non-market based way of running the economy. So that was the overarching conceptual framework, uh, very non-market, even anti-market way of running the economy. So that was point, the first as dimension, planning. The second aspect of it, of course, was that uh, a part of the planning strategy was that India needed to industrialize very rapidly. And uh, because, uh, you know, the experience of Western Europe, Japan, uh, 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 Russia showed that, you know, in order for a country to prosper, uh, you had to industrialize. And of course, Pandit Nehru was and others were very keen on that. And this industrialization was to be led by the public sector. So the second dimension of this was that the public sector was to play a very important role uh, in industrialization. And of course, we had the industrial policy revolution, uh, resolution. And basically what we said was that we divided the economy into three categories, uh, you know, in what were called the commanding heights, only the public sector would operate. There was a, 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 another set of sectors where, you know, we would favor the public sector. And there was a residual category, mostly consumer goods, where we said the private sector could operate. But the public sector was going to be in the vanguard of industrialization. Uh, so that was the second component of that. The third component of that was our attitude to foreign trade and international opportunities. And here, what we did was very, very clear, very extreme. We said that we would close our economy to foreign competition, you know, uh, very, very high tariffs, uh, quantitative restrictions, uh, you know, state trading, canalization, essentially both restricting foreign competition by way of goods, by way of foreign capital, by way of foreign technology. So it was really as if India were a closed economy. And that's how we thought we should industrialize. Behind these barriers, we will get the public sector to invest and grow. So <clears throat> planning, public sector, uh, completely anti-foreign trade, uh, anti-foreign competition of all forms. That was the third. And the fourth form, I think, is not, I think the point I would say is least well recognized. And, and in fact, what distinguishes India from many other countries? Because I think if you looked around the world in the 50s and 60s, many countries did planning. Many countries favored the public sector. Many countries were also very antagonistic towards trade and foreign competition. So that was not unusual. Maybe India did it in a very extreme form. That was not very unusual. What I think was really unusual about India, which is the fourth thing, was to be anti-domestic private sector. So India was, you know, uh, not only did we keep out foreign competition, I think we had a big distrust even of the domestic private sector. And we really, really, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, almost strangled the private sector, domestic private sector in India. Th there were two forms in which this was done. One which we don't, I think, appreciate enough is that India kind of actually nationalized a lot of private industries. You know, uh, Air India 53, LIC 56, uh, you know, uh, uh, the public sector banks, the insurance companies, uh, you know, the state electricity boards, coal, the foreign oil companies, you know, a, a series of nationalizations took place. And also we, we took it to such an extreme that we also nationalized the loss making units. So in the 70s, for example, or the textile units, private sector textile units, heavy engineering units were also taken over. So we nationalized a lot of uh, 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 the economy. And of course, the other very, very distinctive form in which the public sector was kind of, uh, the private sector was taxed was through industrial licensing. Uh, I think if there's one thing unique about India, uh, <clears throat> about that strategy is the, is the fact that we tax the private sector and we did it through this absolutely bizarre, extreme, 
complicated way of industrial licensing where basically you know every aspect of what the private sector did was regulated you know what you could do where you could locate how much you could produce what technology you could get what you could not do how much employment everything was regulated by the government so in a sense if you think about this fourfold strategy it was you know planning <clears throat> favoring the public sector being anti foreign competition and really effectively strangling the domestic private sector so if you think about this therefore it was no surprise that in the first 30 years our rate of economic growth was about uh, uh, you know uh, 3 to 3.5% three in between the 50s and 80s per capita gdp growth was about 1.5% because population growth was close to 2% now, we can get into whether this was good or bad. You know, uh, 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 th that's another matter. But then, of course, what happened, uh, you know, uh, in the 19, beginning in the 1980s, we started liberalizing some of this. First, we started liberalizing the, you know, the, the domestic licensing to some extent. We allowed some uh, foreign investment, especially uh, uh, Maruti Suzuki. And then, you know, we started relaxing what the private sector could do. Now, in the 80s, we didn't do any major reform. It was a bit of tinkering in the direction of slowly chipping away at what we had done in the previous uh, 30 years. And then, of course, we had the famous uh, reform of 1991 under Dr. Manmohan Singh and Narsimha Rao. And many aspects of this, you know, planning, favoring the public sector, uh, closed economy, strangling the private sector, all these four planks were gradually you know, chipped away at and India became a much more open, deregulated, delicensed uh, economy. Uh, and that was what we saw. Uh, and, and that kind of broad consensus, what is called the neoliberal consensus, it was you know, implemented in India. But again, uh, it, this was what most countries in the world were doing in the 1990s. So in some sense, what India did was not that unique. I mean, all over the world, in the wake of the uh, Thatcher uh, Reagan revolution, you know, the Washington consensus, as it's called, took hold. And India also started, uh, you know, kind of believing in that. And then from about 1980 to about 2015, there was this broad consensus about how to run the economy. Of course, there were lots of other additions. You know, we started investing in infrastructure in the 2000s, you know, and, and Jugal was involved in this. We started building a welfare state, you know, rural employment guarantee scheme, you know, uh, PDS, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, 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 all these kind of what you would call a social safety net started getting built. But there was a kind of broad consensus on how to run the economy, which kind of was a reaction to what we had done in the previous 30 years. But then something really interesting has happened in the last five years. And what has happened in the last five years is we have gone back to inwardness. And let me just give you some, some, uh, you know, some elements of, uh, you know, how this is manifesting itself. Uh, you know, Shomitro Chatterjee and I uh, have written a series of papers. So beginning in 2017, 18, India started raising its tariffs. So uh, across the board, and remember, this was breaking a 30-year consensus. India was never a radical reformer, but it always was doing slow, steady, uh, you know, reforms. But in 2017, especially 2018, after that, we started, you know, raising tariffs. Uh, and my number is that if you look at non-agricultural tariffs, our average tariffs were about uh, 10 to 11 percent. They became they're now about 15 to 16 percent uh, average tariffs. So it's quite a quite a big. Of course, it's not the same tariff level as we had in the past, which was in the 100, 150 percent. So we've not gone back to that. But the trajectory is uh, the trajectory and the kind of underlying thinking <coughs> is kind of, you know, going back to the past. So that's one thing that uh, we've done. The second thing we've done, of course, is that, uh, you know, in the last uh, you know, 10 years, most countries have been coming together uh, and becoming part of uh, free trade agreements. 
And India in the last, in the 2000s, India negotiated a lot of free trade agreements. But in the last four or five years, India has chosen actively to stay out of uh, these free trade agreements, especially involving the big partners. You know, the biggest free trade agreement in Asia, which has China in it, uh, is the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership and India. And it has almost every country in Asia and the Pacific. And India chose very consciously to stay out of that. So that was the second. So we've started raising tariffs. Uh, we've stayed out of free trade agreements. And of course, most recently, we saw the government is considering re-instituting uh, licensing for laptops. So, so the whole licensing, which we thought was a thing of the past, is kind of coming back again. Uh, and again, it's not the same as it was before. It's still very narrowly focused. But again, the thinking is we need to go back to, you know. Uh, uh, I think those, if I. No, no, please go. Yeah. Please go uh, and so uh, uh, we have uh, started, uh, um, you know, thinking along those lines again. The other, uh, the, of course, the one big difference with the past is that while we've started turning inward and started raising barriers, <clears throat> we've done <clears throat> two things which are a bit different from the past. One is in the past, we used to use tariffs and quotas and licenses. But now we not only have raised tariffs, we have said, no, now we must start giving subsidies uh, to firms. So the whole production linked incentives that we have now uh, is, 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 uh, is another form of government intervention uh, in order to you know, boost uh, investment and so on. So, so qualitatively, things are, are, are similar to the past, but also a bit different in the past. The, the final difference with the past is the following. I mean, if you think about it in the past, in the 50s to 80s strategy, we did have national champions the national champions were the public sector in India. You know, uh, we believe that, you know, in every sector we had uh, 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 very big public sector enterprises. And we said that they would kind of, you know, uh, uh, propel the economy, uh, industrialize. And, you know, you can take many, many sectors, whether it was tea, whether it was, you know, aeronautics, armaments, uh, you know, heavy engineering, electricals. We had these amazing public sector enterprises that were kind of the champions. But now the difference is that under the new strategy, we are actually, India is promoting private national champions. Uh, and, you know, this is slightly controversial, and I've written about it, of course, is that, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, we, we, have, we know there are two big enterprises groups in India uh, that have uh, received, you know, uh, uh, probably a lot of help and regulatory favors from the government. And uh, unlike in the past, we think that these national champions can actually help India kind of, you know, uh, uh, propel Indian growth and, and you know, uh, do all the things that we expected the public sector to do. Now, <clears throat> these national champions, just a word on this, uh, many countries in the 60s did promote private sector national champions. Korea and Japan most famously promoted these national champions. You know, Korea had all these che balls, uh, which were basically private sector conglomerates. Uh, Japan had these what are called zaibatsus. Um, but as we wrote, there's a big difference between India's promoting of these national champions and what uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, what Korea and Japan did in the past. I think there are two very big differences. In the case of the Indian national champions, one, uh, especially the two big ones, you know, uh, Reliance and Adani Enterprises, and to some extent the Tatas as well, I think they are have a much bigger uh, 
span in terms of the number of sectors in the economy that they're present in. You know, the Chebols and the Zaibatsus were very sector specific. And, you know, uh, but the Indian conglomerates are horizontally like octopuses occupying many, many. So in some ways, the Indian private sector national champions are much more comprehensive in their presence in the economy. Second, and I think the key difference with the Korean and the Japanese thing is that the Indian national champions are mostly in regulated, non-traded sectors. Why is that important? In the case of the Chaebols, what was important was that while they got a lot of favors from the government, subsidies, preferential this, you know, tax breaks, etc., they had to deliver in terms of exporting. So in some ways, why carrots were uh, uh, given to them, there was also the stick that you had to show you were internationally competitive by exporting. So the export metric was a metric of, you know, the discipline that, yes, we're giving you favors, but that's not going to make you lazy and inefficient. But that discipline of export competition is not there in the case of the private sector national champions today, because many of them, or many of the sectors they're in, are regulated sectors like infrastructure, you know, uh, and uh, mostly infrastructure, but also other sectors which which don't as a discipline uh, like those had. So 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 broadly, we have a situation where you know. Uh, we had a, a certain set of policies in the first 30 years. We have a set of policies today that basically are turning inward, uh, but there are some differences in how it's being implemented, how the inward turn is being implemented, some differences. For example, as I said, many more subsidies are being used. And second, many more private sector national champions are being promoted. So, so those are the differences. One other big difference between then and today is in the past, we shut ourselves off to foreign capital. But today, what is very unusual about and, and striking about uh, you know, some of the policies uh, of, and this was true, this is bipartisan, this was true under the Manmohan Singh government, it's true under the Modi government, that we are unusually open to foreign capital flows. That you know, uh, progressively we say you know foreign capital can come in, especially hot money. Uh, you know, uh, 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 has been progressively opened up. So, financial globalization, we have not reversed on that. If anything, we are progressing even more rapidly on financial globalization. What we've turned our back on is what we are called real sector or trade globalization, where we've turned inwards in ways that I just mentioned. Uh, but financially, if anything, we're becoming more open than in the past. So now, the, uh, the, so having spelled out what we did before and what we're doing now, I want to talk about what are the underlying ideas driving this? Uh, you know, what drove it in the past and what is driving it today? Because I think, we should not be cynical. I think our first thing should be to understand, you know, governments take policy actions, obviously, in some cases, because of, you know, vested interests, politics, and all these things. But often there is an underlying ideology or ideas behind that. And so we should try and understand that and take that quite seriously. Now, if you go back to the past, you know, the, the planning era, why did we adopt the the you know what were the ideas that <clears throat> the first of course was we were coming out of an experience of colonialism so essentially our association with uh, you know capitalism was imperialism and therefore you know a, a revolt against imperialism naturally also became a revolt against you know capitalism and things foreign and therefore the turning inward that we did self-sufficiency swadeshi were all rallying cries in the past but they were a, a clear reaction to you know british colonialism and you know it was only natural that we would react against that and, and adopt the policies that we did in addition of course 
or there was this sense that of what would call export pessimism that we thought you know india could not uh, export abroad although if you read ig patel's uh, 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 autobiography he says you know uh, when people talk about export pessimism it was more that the second plan for example uh, didn't really take uh, you know didn't really seriously consider uh, trading opportunities so he says it was more a case of export amnesia than export pessimism per se then of course uh, the other thing to remember is that there was this very strong infant industry argument and this was shared again this idea was shared across the world it was not <coughs> unique to india you know the notion that you know you have a young economy it cannot compete internationally it needs some protection so that it can you know develop its own capability and then become competitive internationally so the infant industry argument was also very powerful that was an idea that i think was very powerful back then and then the final i think idea was that india had a chronic foreign exchange problem in the past and therefore we felt that you know foreign exchange was scarce so we had to restrict imports in order to preserve scarce foreign exchange so these were the kinds of ideas that drove the first wave of you know a policy making which was you know very uh, anti trade anti market etc but i think 75 years on what is animating the new inward turn is actually very different and it's very interesting trying to understand why is it that you know why is it that the modi government has decided that it wants to turn inward and and it's useful to understand my sense is that there are two or three uh, ideas underlying why we are doing this i think the first is that there's a suddenly a belief uh that because of the success of india over the last 30 40 years there is the belief that india is a big market so whereas in the past you did infant industry because you wanted to you know become capable now we believe that india is a very big market and therefore you know even if we couldn't uh, if we don't export it's not that much of a problem because we have a large internal market so i think I, I, and the prime minister always says you know india's strengths are you know democracy demography and demand and the third demand that he thinks is we have domestic demand because we have a big market a big economy now <clears throat> shomitra chatterji and i show that actually that is not quite right i mean india may be the you know i don't know third or the fourth largest world uh, economy but the size of the market for consumer goods is actually not very big if you compare it to china because you know two things india has a lot of poor people uh, who don't really have a lot of purchasing power and command and also the rich have very high savings rates so if you combine these two together we show that the indian market is actually not very not very big but but you know forget about our analysis but the underlying motivation i think is that you know india has a lot of demand the market is big therefore we can afford to become closed we don't need international demand as much because we have a big market and i think that's the first aspect that's uh, driving this i think the second aspect that's driving this uh, inward turn is that we also acquired a lot of confidence in our private sector so when i spoke about promoting national champions the belief is that you know these are not the public inefficient public sector enterprises of the past these are actually very efficient you know uh, large conglomerates who are delivering uh, you know famously take you know jio for example the way it's democratized access to data in india uh is you know is really a, a major achievement uh, similarly if you take a look at the ports uh you know that have been established by the adani enterprises uh they are pretty uh, you know uh, uh, apparently pretty impressive uh, in terms of what they do so 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 the inward turn is also based on the fact that you know unlike in the past we do have players 
private sector players who can take advantage of this inward turn and it will not lead to the kind of inefficiency that we had in the past through the public sector enterprises. So that's the second idea behind uh, this term. I think the third idea behind this term is actually something quite sad, I think quite uh, unfortunate. Uh, there's a famous line which says, you know, the Bourbons remembered nothing and forgot nothing and so committed mistakes again and again. So I think one of the things that's happened to uh, India in the last five years is what I would call amnesia, a, a kind of forgetfulness. And what is that amnesia? The amnesia is that in the period, you know, 1990 to about 2015, for about 25 years, trade was a critical driver of economic growth in India. And people don't seem to realize this. Um, so, so we often think that this is all services, but that's only really partly true. Between 19, say the mid 90s and the late 2010s, uh, for over 25 years, Shomitra Chatterjee and I showed that India's manufacturing exports grew at about 12-13% every year and was the third fastest in the world after China and Vietnam. So it's really odd. We think that, you know, um, failures are intellectual orphans. But the, the really sad thing about what's happening now is that we had success based on trade and somehow we've forgotten that. And so in some ways, uh, uh, when I say what are the positive ideas that are generating this inward turn, you know, the feeling that we have a big market, the feeling that we have a competent private sector, but it's also a kind of ideas, uh, amnesia, a forgetfulness about ideas. We forgot our experience that in the boom years when India, the Indian economy grew at 6 7% for 30 years, it was based on trade and not just on services, but also on manufacturing exports. So in some ways, I think we've forgotten that. I think the fourth idea that is you know, driving this inwardness, which was not true in the past, or maybe a bit different, is security and China. Essentially now, uh, uh, around the world, not just in India, trade and development strategy are more and more being de uh, determined by security considerations. And in the case of India, the key security consideration is, of course, China. So even this recent, uh, uh, you know, in potential import licensing for laptops that we're contemplating is, uh, you know, ostensibly targeted at trying to reduce uh, imports from China. And as we know, we run a very large bilateral trade deficit with China. Uh, it's It's been rising over time. Uh, you know, we have all these problems with, you know, uh, 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 you know, Chinese goods. So I think part of the inward turn is also targeted at China. Uh, th the reason we stayed out of the regional comprehensive economic partnership is also related to China because China is, is a member of that. And if we join that, we would be exposing ourselves to Chinese competition, which we think uh, is something that we shouldn't be for political and economic reasons. So the inward turn also has a big security consideration, which I think is driving this inward turn. So <clears throat> finally, I think there's a fifth uh, idea here, which I think is driving the inward turn. And it's a little bit more controversial. So I want to put it uh, a little bit more carefully. Just as in the first 30 years, our economic nationalism was a reaction to political colonialism and imperialism. So, you know, so in that sense, economic nationalism and political nationalism went hand in hand. Uh, now, I think there's something similar going on. The notion of, you know, uh, in, in today's thing, of course, is not you know, anti-colonialism, but it's a kind of political nationalism that we see that, you know, we're a great country, we're a great civilization. Uh, and so that kind of subtle political nationalism uh, uh, goes along with a kind of economic nationalism. You know, you know, Atman Nirbhata means, you know, we can do it ourselves. 
uh, politically we are uh, you know great we want to become a great nation we can do that by going it alone i mean <clears throat> this is not a watertight argument but i get the sense that you know political and economic nationalism are never far apart and i think to some extent to some extent that's happening even now that the sense of you know national pride uh, that we are all kind of uh, uh, believing in or asked to believe in is coming with the similar thing saying you know we can do it also on our own uh, uh, in terms of economics we have a big private sector we have a big market why can't we do this on our own and so uh, I, I think there's a kind of political and economic nationalism uh, that's going together so I, i've spoken about the differences between then and now I've spoken about some of the ideas that generated uh, then and what is happening now. So I want to turn to the present uh, today and touch a little bit on, on uh, the economy, what's happening. You see, in terms of uh, where uh, <coughs> India stands in the global economy today, there is no question that new international opportunities have opened up for India. Now, <clears throat> Beginning in uh, you know, 2010, 2011, China was starting to become uncompetitive, especially in labor intensive sectors, because they were becoming richer, wages were rising. And so more and more of the low skills exports that China was doing started to migrate to other countries. We calculated that in that phase from about 2011 to 2018, 19, China vacated about $150 billion of low skill exports, but India capitalized on very little of that because, you know, uh, investors, foreign investors, you know, our labor intensive exports never did well. And, and, you know, and that continued to be the case. So that first opportunity, what I would call the China plus one opportunity, we did not take advantage of. But then suddenly now there's a new opportunity for India because, you know, of geopolitical reasons. Uh, I think uh, uh, all investors are, are re-evaluating their China, uh, you know, being invested in China. It's not just that, you know, uh, geopolitics has changed and investors uh, are, are scared about being in India, uh, in China, because of what might happen. But also the Chinese economy has also started turning, uh, uh, you know, uh, growth has uh, come down. Uh, the Chinese uh, government has become uh, very, very anti-foreign investors, anti-domestic investors. So the climate in China has deteriorated economically. It's deteriorated geopolitically and more and more investors are looking at, you know, where they should relocate in order to produce the things they were producing in China. Now, a big part of that has relocated to Vietnam. Some of it has gone to Mexico, but slowly some of those investors are looking at India as a potential alternative destination. And that is why, you know, the most iconic decision here of course is the decision of apple to say we are going to locate in india and we are going to start thinking about producing iphones and other things in india and maybe eventually also you know ratchet up now we'll produce five percent if things are good we can make it 10 15 20 percent uh, and so on so so i think there's a real uh, that's one new opportunity that's opening up for india uh, and I'll come to uh, at the end about whether we can, uh, how we should take advantage of that. The second opportunity that's opened up for India, I mean, it's an opportunity that's important in the current stage, because if you look at the world, the world from the point of view of manufacturing, is kind of deglobalizing. After, uh, you know, things, you know, if you look at world trade in manufacturing, uh, it rose very rapidly for about 20, 25 years. And then, after the global financial crisis in 2011 it started declining and now after the you know the russian invasion of ukraine all of that it's deteriorated so we are seeing a kind of deglobalization in manufacturing but we are not seeing that in services you know services is continuing to globalize and india has a natural advantage in services 
And in fact, if you look at the last three years, just three to four years, India's global export market share of services has risen substantially. Uh, so this is another opportunity that's kind of opening up for India, which I think that India could take advantage of. Now, let me, uh, so, so let me, you know, and, and then we can get into questions. Let me end by saying what the kind of dilemma is for India. The services opportunity is a great opportunity, but we know by definition it cannot uh, be widely shared because only the high skilled take advantage of this. Uh, so, you know, high skilled labor force in India, I don't know, maximum one, two percent. So any services revolution opportunities, while good for the economy as a whole, is not going to provide jobs for India's, you know, hundreds of millions unskilled labor. So, so by definition, the impact of that is going to be limited. So then we say, well, what about low skill manufacturing? which can in fact provide jobs for many more people in India. There, I think <clears throat> the Indian performance has been relatively weak. It's been historically weak. It's also been weak now. But here, and, and let me, I, I might kind of try and end with this. The question is, but if you want to take advantage of these opportunities, we need to have a policy and an institutional environment that can take advantage of this. I think some a lot of very good things have happened in India, which is what Josh Feldman and I call, you know, hardware. We've been very good even in the last five to six years in building hardware. You know, I think there's a real infrastructure boom in India, physical infrastructure boom. There's a digital infrastructure boom in India, and that digital infrastructure boom is not only helping the private sector, but of course the public sector. We know JAM, we know all, all these things have happened because, so the hardware in India is going very well, but I am less confident about the software of economic policy making. Uh, let, let me just say uh, two things here. One, you know, it's not obvious that the rule of law is being, you know, we have rule of law in India. There's a lot of still arbitrary decision making where, you know, investors uh, are not unclear, are not clear about the conditions of, you know, competition. You know, by definition, if you promote national champions, someone is going to be disadvantaged, not just, uh, uh, you know, so, so some foreign investors have been hurt in India while others uh, have benefited. Many domestic investors have been hurt in India uh, because national champions are being provided. So this, the, the playing field for investment is not level and that could come back and that could be an impediment to India taking advantage of this. Finally, to come back to the theme of this talk, I think this inward turn that we've embarked upon cannot be the right policy if we want to become internationally competitive. I mean, I think one of the hardest ideas to understand in economics, the hardest idea, I think, uh, 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 and uh, that's why I don't want to blame anyone, but I think it's a really hard idea to understand, is that if you want to be competitive on exports, you have to be open to imports. And this is a, a deep, deep idea. And this was see the the what is sad is that in India's boom period between 1990 and 2015, not only did exports boom, imports boomed as well. So the two go together. The notion that you know somehow exports can boom and imports can be uh, can be restricted is just not possible. No country has done that. Uh, you know, to some extent, of course, you can run current account surpluses, but both need to be very dynamic. So I think the deep problem with inwardness as an idea is that, you know, if you want to be internationally competitive, you cannot afford to be inward. Uh, and if India cannot be internationally competitive, if India cannot export 12, 13 <coughs> percent double digit uh, exports and imports, 
our growth cannot be reach seven, eight percent that we aspire to. No country in the history has sustained seven, eight percent economic growth without having double digit trade growth. And, and, and unless we can do that, and I think our policy of inwardness that we've once again returned to, albeit in a slightly different and milder form, might come in the way of India truly becoming internationally competitive and you know generating the kinds of growth and employment that we need for India to become a really major economic power. Let me stop there and let me take questions. Thank you, Arbin, for a very, very exhaustive presentation on a of evolution of India's trade and uh, development policy in the historical perspective. Uh, we will now open up uh, the floor for questions. So please uh, be very pointed and very brief, and uh, so that uh, uh, we can accommodate as many people uh, questioners as possible. Uh, 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 Jugal, I, I see all these things floating up. Uh, yeah, yeah, that can, please. My I request, please, uh, all those emojis uh, kindly stop for a while. So we will please, Viran, Mr. Sethi, please stop uh, uh, this thing. Uh, you, you, I, I appreciate all the the the, the yeah, praise, yeah, yeah. But, but I think let's he's, uh, focus I think on. He's, not, he's unable to stop it. I think, please. Is there any problem? Let me check, sir. Me check. Uh, stop it, I think. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Sethi, you want, and Prabhakar, Prabhakar Sao, uh, let me call uh, Dr. Prabhakar Sao first. No, you, you're not, you're mute. Mute. <coughs> Uh, uh, Professor Sai, you have to unmute. Uh, please click on unmute. We can't. We can't hear. Uh, Professor Sai, could you please press unmute? I think his problem. Yeah, we are not able to. Yeah. So. <coughs> Let's maybe Dr. Sahu, maybe you can send a question on chat or something which we can look yeah, at. Yes. Yeah. Please please uh, type out a question. Can I ask one question, please? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yes, yes, Dr. Sahu. No, no, I just actually wanted to thank uh, Dr. Subramanian for an excellent talk. It was always a pleasure to uh, listen to him. Uh, just a couple of small points. I completely agree with some of the points he has already made. Um, you know, I completely believe that inward orientation is no way good to improve the productivity, competitiveness or anything. It's done deal everywhere. But I think, you know, inward orientation in the last five years, I feel as it reflects uh, that has been kind of exaggerated a little more than that. Let me give you some facts. You see, all these FTS negotiations and we have done with uh, you know, almost 3-4 and 3-4 we are negotiating, it has happened in the last five years. And uh, it is not that uh, exports slowed down only in the last five years. In fact, last year we reached seven, 700 plus billion dollars. In fact, if you remember, you spoke about like 95 to 2015, the export growth, growth was going hand in hand with the uh, uh, development or, or uh, output growth, but the numbers are something different. Starting from 2011 till 2017 and 18, when you were in the office, the export was around the same $311 billion. So it is not like, uh, yes, 2017, 18, actually the tariff rate started going up for different reasons. I think you know that. There was an issue of inverted tax structure or duty structure, which has been corrected quite significantly. Uh, and then we had uh, what we call a different uh, phase altogether, starting from 2017-18 onwards till the end of the pandemic. <coughs> so I feel it is a little more emphasized on inward orientation in the last five years. 
and the point the first point for why this inward orientation is like okay domestic demand uh, I, I strongly believe that yes there is a huge domestic demand you spoke about the chinese if you look at the trade deficit is china or imports from china 88 percent of our imports from china constitutes only intermediates and inputs so there is a huge demand domestically in sectors such as electronics, computer appliances, capital goods, and that is where we are giving the PLIs and inviting these multinational companies or big investors to set up base. And let me also clarify, I think it is also very clear, it is not meant for nation, national champions. If you look at the PLI, uh, of course, we have not done great job in the sense uh, out of 2 lakh crores, it's only 4,000 or 5,000. Uh, crores uh, are given, it's less than 3%. And it is not meant for national uh, champions. It is it is for everybody to grab and there are other companies which have done well and it's uh, including Apple. And uh, last last year, 300 billion, $3 billion exports last year, I think, uh, yeah, last year it's some figure around 5 billion. So we are doing uh, well in augmenting the capabilities where we are depending on outside. I think this decision which has been taken about the licensing it is basically to augment the domestic production so where we are depending on the outside. And you only also pointed out there is a the kind of deglobalization or the supply chain fragmentation that is taking place. So everybody is focusing to have some kind of uh, uh, you know, own supply chain or uh, the capabilities, we are doing that. Uh, in fact, the trade deficit to the China, $100 billion, it's not that kind of concern, but what we are concerned about it, that we should not be over dependent on somebody who, who can use it as a weapon in the future. Uh, regarding, um, you know, there are many points where I have certain numbers to tell that it is not that much of inward orientation in last five years as such. Yes, certain decisions were taken for certain purposes, but they are done with the objectives. I think we are going to get the output as we go on. That was my limited point. Thank you. Thank you. So, Arbin, would you like to take other questions uh, together? Or? Yeah, yeah uh, and uh, it'd be great if you could have a short, quick question so we can get as many people yeah. as possible, yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, let me call uh, uh, Dr. Himanshu Rao you for your uh, remarks. Yeah, Dr. Rao, Himanshu Rao. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Just uh, I have put the question also in the chat box uh, in a very specific question. In the past thirty years, you have summarized, but in the past thirty years of Indian planning, the past fifteen years is the Nehru period, which. Uh, Generally argued by Panagaria in his book that it is very liberal trade and foreign investment policy. So how do you look uh, that uh, that past 15 years? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, would you like to take now? Yeah, or? I, I think that, uh, you know, it's true that until 56, you know, things were more open. I think after 56, uh, late 50s, early 60s is when things, I think, started, uh, you know, becoming really closed and then uh, under Mrs. Gandhi, it was, you know, taken uh, uh, another level. So so the first maybe 10 years were, were, were less closed because the second plan in any case began only in 56. Okay. Um, we'll have uh, Mr. Manoj Jha. Manoj Jha, you wanted to say? Yes, sir. Sir, you, it was a very enriching session and you said if you want to be competitive on exports, then you have to be open for imports as well. And if you look at the data, India's trade to GDP ratio in fiscal year 23 was around 45%, but it is less than 30% for the USA. Can we say that the India is more tradely open than the USA? And the follow-up question is that China's saving rate during the early 2000s was around 50%. But it is only 30 to 32 percent for India now. And if we want to sustain 8 percent growth rate, we have to go around 35, 36 percent saving rate. How can we increase that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, see, firstly, uh, to look at simple trade to GDP ratios across countries, one has to be a little bit careful 
because um, a lot of it also depends upon uh, the the size of, of the internal economy. It's generally the case uh, that small countries trade, smaller countries trade more than larger countries, and therefore you know you have to be careful about these assessments. Uh, I, I think a more um, direct way of assessing this is in terms of your trade policies, how open or closed you are. So assessing it in terms of outcomes is a bit more tricky because trade to GDP is an outcome and that's determined by a lot of other factors. You see, uh, you ask also a good question about how to raise savings rates. My response to that would be to say that I think we think of savings rate as something that's exogenous. And if you look at our India's boom period, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, savings rate shot up. And to some extent, savings rate shoots up when growth and investment itself take off. So the notion that you need, uh, whether savings are a determinant or an outcome, is actually, uh, I think, is, is can be debated. <clears throat> and I belong to the school which kind of doesn't take savings as a determinant necessarily. You know, if you grow, you're going to save a lot. And, and the mechanism through which that happens is, of course, when you grow very rapidly, uh, your corporate savings uh, uh, increase very sharply because, uh, you know, you're doing exporting a lot, you're making a lot of profits. And that's what happened in many countries. And that's what happened in India as well, that in our boom period, you know, our corporate savings also went up uh, quite substantially. So. I think that one has to be careful about thinking of savings as a binding constraint or as a determinant of growth, as opposed to something that, you know, can be in turn itself determined by growth. So if you create the conditions for investment, maybe that will generate the growth and produce the savings to finance that investment as well. Mr. Uh, Chidambaram Ayer, he had raised his hand very early. So would you uh, yes. put your question? Very brief. Yeah, thank you so much for this talk. You know, I just want to see you mentioned the rule of law at the fag end of your talk. So, you know, from the from the way we define institutions, the, the Douglas not the def kind of definition. So if you want to look at the three periods that you defined, 1950 to say 80 and 91 to 2015 and now, so how would you compare them and how do you, how important do you think institutions are for you know the development and trade thank you yeah you know that's a great yeah that's a great question it's also a a, a very uh, tricky question because i think what the evidence seems to suggest is that you know in the short run you can have growth with weak institutions and without rule of law but over longer periods of time, you know, it becomes more and more difficult to sustain that. Of course, the, the big exception to all this is, of course, China, right? And, and China, uh, uh, but many would say that, in fact, uh, what happened in the, uh, during the Chinese boom, you know, under Deng Xiaoping, was that even though it may have been a communist system, you know, there was a certain stability uh, of, uh, you know, investment climate, uh, uh, some kind of rule of law in its own terms. Uh, but uh, uh, so, but in the Indian case, I think, uh, given that we have a democracy and things, given we have all this, I, I think it's probably more important to have a rule of law because by definition, we don't operate or we never used to operate an authoritarian system. So, so it's almost as if, uh, you know, if you are a democracy, you have to have better institutions, better more rule of law in order to generate the uh, the, the confidence in investors that uh, uh, that you know things will be okay. Uh, what is clear is that, you know, over time, it's not as if India's institutions have been were perfect before and have you know suddenly deteriorated. But but I I do think that you know, the kinds of reversals and, and, and unevenness of implementation uh, that we know uh, is taking place in the last three, four years, that can't be uh, good for investment because we know many foreign uh, uh, firms have left, many domestic firms have been at the receiving end of state action, which is arbitrary. 
Uh, and so I think we have to be, uh, you know, a bit careful on that score. Uh, okay. Sir, uh, we have uh, three questions here posted. Yes, uh, can I, I read those? Yeah, no, no, I'll just uh, call them. They can. Let's give them an opportunity. Uh, Sivanand Senapati, uh, question on agriculture sector. Are you there, Mr. Yeah, Senapati? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. It's a very uh, good presentation on uh, macroeconomic view. So I, 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 you talk about uh, MSME sector, service sector, but uh, agriculture sector where still a large number of people depends. So how this in your orientation will fit into the agriculture sector or growth? Or, or maybe how, what are the missed opportunity when, when we, uh, uh, we are into the export promotion scheme? So what are the missed opportunities related to agriculture sector? Thank you. Uh, I think that is a very important question. Um, you know, you could argue that, uh, and I, I, I didn't get into this in any detail, that, you know, if you look at the uh, Korean, Taiwanese, <coughs> Japanese, <coughs> and the Chinese experience after 1978. In all of those cases, you know, agriculture did very well on the back of land reforms and widespread ownership of land. So the combination of widespread ownership of land and rapid agricultural productivity growth were in fact very critical in, you know, the transformations that happened in uh, all you know in some of these big East Asian countries, and to some extent that was the missed opportunity for India, that you know we never were able to successfully you know really do land reform so that you know uh, you know ownership was widespread and therefore the benefits of agricultural productivity growth were widespread. One and second also, we never managed to achieve the um, kinds of you know. <clears throat> You know, if you look at China after 1978, the fact that the agriculture grew so rapidly meant that industrialization also happened close by and industrialization happened based on China's comparative advantage. You know, all the you know labor intensive uh, manufacturing that began in China was based on rural industrialization. In India, we neither had the uh, agricultural uh, uh, transformation. We neither had the widespread ownership of land. We emphasized very capital intensive industrialization. So neither the push of rapid agricultural growth nor the pull of labor intensive manufacturing growth happened. And it's this combination of the two that I think could have is the big missed opportunity. And, and, and agriculture is a big part of that. Uh, 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 and so and even if you see today that relative to other countries, we have too many people in agriculture uh, relative to what we should have. And it reflects, you know, failures in agriculture, but it also reflects failures in manufacturing and the fact that we couldn't do labor intensive industrialization like China, Korea, Japan did uh, earlier on. Okay, we have, uh, as I see, there are four more questions, and I'll first call uh, Nibedita Vanja. We haven't asked a lady participant, so let's give her preference. I will take the other three later. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank you for a really insightful presentation. Uh, sir, you made a very important point about India being still not a good enough consumer's market, although it might be third or fourth largest in terms of GDP. And the 2020 data says that India adds a billionaire every week. So a question, and you also uh, nicely mentioned that how we have not been great with land reforms and agricultural not transfer. So even in a trap, particularly when it comes to Eastern states, where majority of the consumption is welfare schemes driven. At least in the first 30, 40 years, uh, that you know, promoting national champions was in the backdrop of a socialist setup. Now that we have slightly moved away from that, and how do you reconcile that? You know, how do you also become a good enough consumer driven, econ uh, you know, consumption driven economy at the same time generating, uh, uh, you know, enough employment opportunities? Uh, and but in the current setup, uh, most so when you know when you mentioned the last point that 
more in the backdrop of a nationalist political, uh, you know, inward driven, you know, the inward agenda is more in the backdrop of a political nationalism. How do you take care of so many issues of how to make it a, a long question, but I hope you got yeah, it. No, no, I, I think I think it's a great question. Let, let me let me um, uh, you see, remember that the distribution of income and everything depends upon employment opportunities. I think employment is the key to determining, you know, for having structural transformation, sharing the wealth widely, because and, and what we say, the way we, these days we think about is to say is there's a, a market driven distribution of income and then there's a post market distribution that depends upon government policies. I think what you very nicely put your finger on is that we are focusing on this post distribution via you know welfare schemes etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's always going to have a limited impact because most of this depends upon providing good jobs for as many people as possible that's what determines this and so let me bring it down to uh, uh, odisha for example you know, when I was CA, I had a long uh, session with the, the chief minister. And to me, it has been always a mystery to me, an absolute mystery, why Odisha cannot become a major exporter of textiles and clothing to the world. Now, <clears throat> remember, this government has done very well on welfare. So, you know, all credit to the government for having done, you know, the basic needs are being met in a very nice fashion. But the employment opportunities in cre being created in Odisha are not spectacular. I mean, a, a lot more could be done, but that has to come from having, you know, uh, labor intensive uh, manufacturing mostly. Uh, and that means so. So, for, And the way you do labor intensive manufacturing is by exporting because you have unlimited demand. Now there are lots of opportunities and Odisha has two really critical ingredients for becoming a champion exporter of labor intensive commodities. It has cheap labor relative to other parts of India, and it is geographically it's on the coast so that it should be able to export anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and yet. Odisha is, a, you know, lags behind in terms of creating these, um, uh, you know, manufacturing opportunities and employment opportunities. Because it's employment opportunities that's going to determine whether we have, you know, a, a fulfilled, you know, a providing jobs, a, 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 you know, reducing the inequality of income. It all depends upon. So if you look at India more broadly, high skilled people have great jobs. Uh, manufacturing, formal manufacturing is very limited. So essentially, the Indian labor market is a vast market of informality. It's basically an informal labor market, but the way to change it is by providing uh, good jobs. And to me, it's very disappointing that, you know, a state like Odisha, you know, other states, you could say Bihar has the cheap labor, but maybe doesn't have the connectedness uh, to international. Uh, maybe the geography is a bit more unfavorable. But Odisha has been, you know, and nothing should prevent Odisha from becoming the world's leading exporter of textiles and clothing. But, you know, so, so that's, I think, the challenge and that's what needs to be done. Okay, we'll have Dilip Bisoy. I think I can see Dilip Bisoy has raised a hand. Are you there, Mr. Bisoy? No, I, I just want to know, is there any successful role model uh, for this inward economic uh, uh, where we are now pursuing? Uh, good question. I, I, it's hard to find one. It's really hard. Uh, certainly in, in the post-war period amongst developing countries, uh, all the successes have been outward oriented exporting economies, you know, very hard. I mean, and the best case is China, you know, which is as big as India, uh, basically grew on the back of exports. Okay. Savir, Mr. Savir. You have a question on uh, Make in India? Uh, yeah, I, yes, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. So you talked about a kind of trade-off between inwardness and uh, 
export competitiveness. Uh, whereas recently we have seen that uh, the government of India is pitching for a campaign with a slogan uh, that make in India, make for the world. So my question is, how would you evaluate this new campaign given the uh, trade-off you talked about? Sorry, given the? Trade-off between inwardness and export See, make in India, make for the world, I, I, I think is exactly what I would say. You, but the key point is you have to make for the world. Uh, if you make in India and make only for India via inward policies, that's not going to... Uh, and the point is that here, I think the notion that there's a trade-off is what I think I'm trying to persuade you we should not have. You know, the more outward we are, outward looking we are, the more we can make for the world. And that's the key point. You know, you cannot make for the world if you say I'm going to favor making in India. Pankaj, I think you want to ask a question, right? Yes, sir. Um... Adding to uh, Sabir's uh, question, I have a small uh, question. Sir, actually, uh, what we are seeing uh, when Modi took the power, and there is a lot of, you know, uh, first about made in India, and then comes make in India, and then comes Atmanirbhar Bharat, and then whole set of, you know, uh, changes in the policy. I mean, to me, uh, it appears as, uh, you know, a kind of a puzzle. As you said rightly, I mean, nothing learned, nothing, you know, forgotten kind of thing. So, I mean, does like government lack a clear cut policy for itself to take country forward? And whenever they are making uh, this kind of statements and uh, you know catchy uh, basically pages being used to uh, invite the emotion of the you know nation, does it does they really mean it? I mean, you know, when it comes to policy and you know implementing at ground zero, how do you look at all those? Or do you think that in near future there would be some new sloganering that would be coming up? to uh, fill the gaps, yeah. You're asking a very politically tricky question, Pankaj, <laughs> which, I, I, which I'm not sure whether, uh, you, see, you know, I, th I think the question of, I mean, I mean, the deeper question you're asking, which is what I'm trying to address is, why, why are we, why have we turned inward? Do they believe this uh, or, uh, I, I think there is a lot of conviction in this. I think they do believe that, you know, being inward can help us. And and I think that is kind of misguided. I, I think that that is kind of misguided. And and um, so, so that's what I would say. And, 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 and it's almost as if, you know, there's a kind of uh, clash of ideas or, mm -hmm. or I would say even a clash between this idea and, and not just but as I keep saying, you know, it's the experience of the previous 25 successful years, we've kind of forgotten, right? Uh, that, we, you know, India was a, a really dynamic, growing economy uh, based on uh, on um, uh, uh, on trade and exports. <coughs> now, one last point, and just to, just to be careful here, that when we, even when we did well in terms of growth and exports, uh, we did we did a lot of services sector boom, the IT sector boom, which is high skill. Even though manufacturing boom, high skilled manufacturing boom, we have never been able to really, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of uh, low skilled manufacturing internationally. And this has been true for seventy five years. In fact, if or some of you can maybe one of the uh, 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 most uh, you know I feel the uh, a chart that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Shomitro Chatterjee and I produced, which is probably maybe the biggest indictment of 75 years of Indian development. We have a chart in a paper which shows uh, what is India's share of the global labor force and what it's, is its share of global exports in labor intensive commodities. Uh, and, and if you see the contrast between India and China, India and China are about roughly 22% of the global workforce amongst developing countries. China has 50% global export market share in these commodities, labor intensive commodities, and India has 6 7%. That is the magnitude of how we have not been able, and that's not a fault of this government. It's been true for 75 years. 
Uh, and that's, I think, um, something we have not really been able to do. And I would love for Odisha to, you know, show us that it can be done. <laughs> so I think we have nearly uh, come to the. Uh, oh, you have one more question. Quickly, Mr. Subal Danta, please. Uh, we'll wind up by one, eight o'clock. Just please, quickly. And also, uh, also, sir, Professor Sinema's party had. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's take Sinema's party first and then Subal. Sorry. Okay. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much. Arbinji, thank you so much. Only one thing uh, I am located in um, Ijal Mizoram. No discussion here on economics, trade, commerce, export, import is complete without Lukis or Actis. So, in your view, uh, what is the area India should look at? Southeast Asia, South Asia, African, or any other region of the world in terms of both <clears throat> export and import? Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, 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 Professor Party, the answer is very simple. We should look globally everywhere. You know, no one reason, you know, uh, we need to generate jobs based on labor intensive uh, uh, exports and manufacturing. Anyone who will, any country that will take our exports. But the point is that we have to, you know, create the conditions where we will be, you know, uh, you know, generating these jobs and exporting the products. Because remember, we cannot generate jobs by exporting to the domestic market alone. No country has done that. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Subal, please. Uh, Mr. Subal, you had a question. Otherwise, we'll wind up. Yeah, I think he has a network problem, he said. Okay. Uh, uh, in that case, I, we are almost uh, we are reaching the uh, time limit. Uh, I really don't wish to sum up. Uh, he presented his thoughts so lucidly and in so with such clarity that really uh, there is no summing up needed but certain things come out very clearly that uh, a uh, our uh, trade policy needs to be much more uh, you know evidence based what we have learned from the past and what mistakes we committed and how other countries have succeeded this has to be there and there are lots of puzzling things which have happened and we didn't discuss agricultural uh, issues relating to agriculture recently and, and Professor Gulati has written a very nice piece recently how all kinds of restrictions we have clamped has actually spiked inflation, food inflation. So we need to be far more careful in crafting our trade policies, notwithstanding what Dr. Prabhakar Sahu has said. And I know how uh, policy making is an art of compromising so many interests. Number two, uh, the emphasis on labor-based, uh, labor-intensive manufacturing, and he is spot on in that. I think until we crack that uh, hugely uh, important issue, I think uh, shared prosperity will elude us. So these are two very important things. And number three, institutional uh, institutions and level playing field. I think uh, that, that's very, very important. So these three are very major points. Uh, thank you enough. I think uh, you, it's an absolutely fascinating lecture as always. Everybody was engaged. Uh, you have been uh, very energetic in your presentation. A lot of questions. You have been very patient with the questions. So thanks a lot. We look forward to having you again in some occasion. And be generous with us. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jugal, first of all, I, I mean, it's a pleasure to uh, be with all of you. Uh, uh, um, you know, I have one wish uh, <laughs> that if there's one policy I would like to be reformed even before the inwardness, <laughs> it's the fertilizer subsidy. So, you know, uh, uh, if you can do something to make that happen, yeah, yeah. I would be... Uh, uh, I, we yesterday, In fact, incidentally, yesterday with Dr. Gulati, we have again back to that conspiracy of working together on fertilizer. So uh, very shortly, we might start working on that. Uh, so that's it. Uh, Pankas, I would now request you to offer a formal vote of thanks before we wind up. Uh, thank, thank you. One minute. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It was such a wonderful presentation. And uh, I think all the audiences today engaged with you the way it could have been. And uh, we are so privileged to have you today to deliver this lecture. We are truly honored that you accepted our invitation to share your wisdom and expertise.
on one of the politically tenuous topic as I see it, trade on development policy in the planning era and contemporary landscape. And the, the worldwide now, there has been a lot of debate about trade, not only in India, the entire world is looking now, have in a way, revived this new mercantilism. And so is India in some way or other, but well, it differs from country to country. So you're offering deeper perspective on the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for India in the unfolding global political economy is quite illuminating. On behalf of the Odisha Economic Association and all those present here today, I extend our heartfelt gratitude for your time, knowledge, and the passion with which you have engaged with us. Your presence has been a source of inspiration, and we look forward to continued learning from your expertise in the near future. Thank you so much, sir, once again for with us to be with us. And I would also like to thank all the participation participants, those who are spared their valuable time with us and they engaged with the uh, Dr. Subramaniam. It was quite, uh, you know, enlightening. And many thanks to all OEA members, General Secretary, uh, President Sir, and all the members for their support and help. And we look forward towards upcoming events and your participation and your encouraging uh, involvement. Thank you so much once again. Thank you all. Thank you, Arvind. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much.